Hi, I'm Dana Rep. I'm an adjunct artist with Elements of Education. I teach a class for Sammy called History Connect in partnership with Fort Nisqually Living History Museum. Today I'm going to dive into the often asked questions about the 19th century hygiene habits. In other words, bathing. Admittedly, the 19th century Victorians maintained a different level of clean from what we know today. Bodily smells were probably more pungent than we would generally accept, but overall, while different, I would say that many of them were rather clean. Bodily cleanliness is a relative term. What I consider clean and what you consider clean may vary by a lot. So what I cover today is the mainstream norms. There are always going to be people who fall into the extremes on both sides, so please keep that in mind. For starters, did they have soap? Yes, they had soap. The earliest evidence of people making soap was in Babylon in 2800 BC. I'm going to give you a seriously basic lesson on soap right now. Soap is a salt. The chemical reaction process of making soap is called saponification. It's where an oil or fat, which is an acid, is mixed with lye, which is your base, to form soap or salt. The Victorians even made their own soap. It was one of the many chores people did at least a couple of times each year. By 1850, soap was becoming so important that it was the fastest growing industry in the United States. So how did they get the supplies they needed like lye? Well, they made it by collecting water that ran, was run over wood ashes, preferably hardwoods. And depending on the strength they needed, they may run the water through those ashes several times. They got their oil and fats by using drippings left over from cooking, so think like bacon grease, and uncooked fats from animals after they were butchered. Their soap did a fine job cleaning, but probably didn't smell very nice. Animal fats tend to go rancid. And today people make their own soaps, however, they mainly use vegetable and nut oils along with herbs and essential oils to make it smell better. I personally think that some of the Victorian soap makers did add perfumes or herbs to make it smell better, but overall it was likely a plain product. The funny thing about soap is that there was a lot of debate on whether or not it was good to use when bathing. Many felt that it was too drying to the skin or that you would be depleting the sebaceous glands from producing natural oils if used too often. So oftentimes bathing may have only consisted of using a sponge or rag and plain water. Bathing has had its ups and downs in popularity throughout the centuries. 1500 BC, the Egyptians were bathing with soap. In 300 BC, the Romans are bathing regularly and using soap. But in 400 AD, the Roman Empire fell, and with it, the decline of cleaning habits. In the Middle Ages, what guided bathing habits depended on where you lived, who was ruling, their beliefs on bathing, and any superstitions of the time. That makes it easy, right? For example, in the Middle East, they were bathing as much as twice a day, but at the same time in Europe, the Europeans feared taking baths. They thought it would make you sick. And some who did say bathing was good only recommended it in the spring, not in the summer, because that would shock the system into illness. Many felt that the best solution to keeping clean was to wear a cloth gown under your clothing. In a previous video, I showed you a garment called a chemise. A chemise is worn under your clothing against your skin. It's basically your underwear. Men wore something similar to a woman's chemise, only they were more like, I guess, our long underwear of today. The purpose of wearing it was that it collected sweat from your skin, so you would own several of these garments and change them daily. Before the 19th century, that garment was made of linen. At the end of the 18th century, it was made of felted wool. Talk about itchy, sweaty and itchy, the perfect combination. In the early 19th century, it changed back to linen, and then as cotton became a popular, inexpensive, and accessible fabric, cotton took over. Changing this undergarment did help with cleanliness. We still believe that today, as evidenced by the fact that we all, at least hopefully all, change our undergarments daily, even though we may wear the same jeans a couple of days in a row. In my opinion, it's helpful, but it doesn't actually negate the need for a bath. So what changed people's minds about bathing? Bathing was gaining popularity and importance in the 18th century. Benjamin Franklin is quoted as saying, tolerate no uncleanliness in body, clothes, or habitation. But what truly began to change people was the Industrial Revolution after the 1830s. During the Industrial Revolution, bathing became quite important. You see, when factories came to cities, aside from jobs coming, pollution was also one of the results. 
Machinery powered by coal put off soot and ash and other gases. Steam engines produced smoke and slaughterhouses were washing their debris into the street. Bucket privies, dung carts, and cesspits were the common methods of disposing of human waste. Add environmental pollution to that and you have the perfect recipe for widespread life-threatening diseases like cholera and smallpox, especially for the working classes. The smell must have been absolutely horrendous. I understand why nosegays were popular things to carry about. Nosegays were little bouquets of very aromatic flowers and herbs. They may have helped with some of the stench, but some believed it would actually prevent sickness when walking about the dirty cities. Patently untrue. With all of that going on, people came to associate smell with health, cleanliness, and respectability. Smell is powerful. Smells remind you of grandma's cooking and mom's chocolate chip cookies, or the time you came home and realized that the dog had been left alone way too long and they used the living room rug as their personal toilet. One evokes delight, the other disdain. In the 19th century, unpleasant smells equated to lower classes. The poor working classes lived in areas where they couldn't easily get away from the smells. Their living conditions were crowded. Their domiciles were not known for being well kept. There were a lot of absentee landlords who neglected maintenance on the properties. All they did was collect the rent and allow the buildings to fall into disrepair, creating unsafe and unclean living situations. The tenants shared public water sources, which had been known to be the source of many diseases, and shared laundering areas. Because they were poor, they had very little by the way of material niceties and little ability to leave the situation. Now, middle and upper class people could live out of the city and get away from those smells and the squalor. They were able to use soap to clean their clothing. The poor, on the other hand, were using urine to disinfect their clothes. The ammonia smell would have been quite powerful. Yes, I did say urine. There was an absolutely huge industry in the 19th century based all around urine. It's a fascinating study, but I won't go into it today. Filth and odors of the 19th century were not seen only as a health concern, but also as a moral concern. Cleanliness and good smells equated to respectability and good morals, if it were only that simple. We've all read of scoundrels living in lovely places and saints that live in the worst parts of the world. But in Victorian times, the outward appearance was extremely important, and they spent an inordinate amount of time reading about it, discussing it, and working to achieve the perfect outward appearance in order to be considered respectable and morally sound in society. Does that sound familiar? Baths have been around for centuries. The Romans were known for their bathhouses. Victorian England and the continent or United States were not as big on them. However, they did exist, and those who used them thought they should be in every single town. If they didn't use bathhouses, what did they use? I wish this were a simple and quick question to answer, but it's not. It's up there with the question of did they wash or not. There was a shower invented in the 1700s. It was basically a cistern of water over a wash tub. There was no drain, so it had to be emptied manually. Bathtubs led the market over showers, and they were they too were not tied to a drain and had to be manually emptied by using a siphon. I'm going to start with how the wealthier gentleman class bathed and then how the working class handled hygiene. The wealthy are quite different from everyone because of the servant staff they had available to them. If the wealthy person wanted something akin to a shower, she or he stood in their tub located in their bathroom. It's where we get our modern term bathroom. However, they didn't necessarily have a toilet in the same room. Your commode or chamber pot was usually in your bedroom and then emptied by your servant in the morning. But back to baths. Their servants would take the water that was warmed on the stove to their room in buckets or large pitchers and pour it over them. They wiped their skin down with soap on a rag or sponge and then rinsed it off in the water. Since soap is ubiquitous at this time in the 19th century, I'm excluding folks that simply rinsed off with plain water and did not use it. This bathing process sometimes took as many th as three servants one for warming the water, another for hauling it to the bathroom, and another to assist the pouring of the water on the bather. If they wanted a submersion bath, the servants would haul numerous buckets of water and fill the tub. After the bath, they would siphon off the water as there was no drain. Depending on the master of the house, a bath may happen every day, once every two weeks, once a month, or seasonally. But if they didn't take an immersion bath or even a shower, they did wash at the wash basin daily. Remember, outward appearance and cleanliness was paramount to the Victorians. 
I'm sure many of you have seen those large ironstone pitchers and bowls sitting on tables in museums or in movies. Some are plain and some are quite ornate. They at very least use a small pitcher of water and a sponge to wash their hands, face, feet, and personal areas each day before dressing. Today we tend to take hot baths, generally over 100 degrees. In the 19th century, there was heated debate over the water temperature. The Victorians seemed to mainly be of the belief that cold water was more healthful. It was thought to toughen you up and to invigorate your circulation. Its bracing and strengthening effects were long maintained. Cold baths were anything under 85 degrees. The colder, the better. In one article, it was recommended that once you rise from bed, no matter the season, go straight to the stream and submerge yourself. Doing this after eating or in the evening was injurious to your health, though. It was said that many a person had died from bathing in the evening, unless under the doctor's strict orders, of course. In another article in 1835, it is said that the cold bath is too shocking, but to take a hot bath, anything between 86 and 96 degrees, nothing higher than the temperature of the body was most beneficial. Today, you and I would call that a tepid bath. The tepid bath was considered gentler on the more delicate persons and children. It is less injurious to the skin because it did not create the astringent properties of cold water on the skin. It said in cases where the patient is too weak to bear the bath of 40 degrees, one of 65 acts like a charm. Rheumatism is benefited by whatever strengthens the system. Now, rheumatism is, the, is inflammation of generally most of your joints. Today, they tie it to many types of arthritis, fibromyalgia, gout, lupus, and scleroderma. Later on, hot baths over 97 degrees were for relaxation and specific medical treatments. In the 19th century, hot springs were often the places of health spas. People went to these places for treatment of various conditions under the direction of a doctor. They would sometimes bathe three times a day for about 15 minutes at a time and stay there at the health spa for weeks at a time in search of a cure for some ailment. The results varied quite a lot. The debates go back and forth for 60 plus years on bathing temperatures. My conclusion is use whatever temperature makes you happy, unless you're running a high fever, then don't take a hot shower or bath. The working classes didn't have large bathtubs where they could submerge themselves while servants added warm, cool, or hot water, let alone a whole room to dedicate to the process. But they did recognize that bathing was important, although they accomplished their morning toilette a little less luxuriously. Toilette means the act of dressing or grooming oneself. They too used a pitcher and wash basin to wash each morning, but in an 1848 article in the North Star paper, they recommended a bath at least once a week, though it should be daily, especially for children. The bath could be cold. They recognized that it, it was a great antidote to the greater part of diseases. They said, nor is there an excuse of not bathing because of the absence of bathing fixtures. The deficiency can be remedied, however humble, in every family. Adopt a common wash tub, half filled with water, into which children should be daily plunged, adults using a vessel of the same kind. Funny that while they recommended that adults not bathe after vigorous exercise, they did recommend that children run around vigorously before a bath. I can only imagine how hot those kiddos would have wanted to get before being plunged into that tepid water and bathed. This wash tub in the middle of the kitchen or bedroom for washing the family is something that stays with us until well into the 20th century. Many families did not have running water until after World War II, so a wash tub was the only answer for any kind of bathing. The wash tub was likely the same one they used for washing the laundry. Did you know that well over 1 million households in America today are still without indoor plumbing? So back to the Victorians. After a bath, it is recommended that those who have delicate skin dry themselves with a sponge instead of a towel if they want to maintain their soft skin for the friction of the towel will not fail to take off the epidermis, which would render the skin tougher and more uneven. Yet in other articles, it tells people to use a towel and rub vigorously throughout the body for 10 full minutes to get the blood circulating. As the bath becomes more common, there are a number of recommendations for an aromatic bath. Today, we dump bubble bath, bath bombs, and smelly salts to soften our skin and relax us. The Victorians used aromatic herbs, flowers, and fragrances in their bath 
in addition to soaps. They use things like anise, clove, July flowers, balm, basil, sweet marjoram, fennel, hyssop, laurel, lavender, rosemary, thyme, mint, or anything else that had an agreeable scent. After they strained off the liquor from the herbs they planned to use, they added a little brandy or camphorated spirits of wine. They also recommended the use of scented oils after bathing to replenish moisture to the skin. Flaxseed oil was of particular regard. Another option for maintaining a good smell or smelling clean for the wealthy was to purchase perfume or cologne to cover up body odor. The less expensive option more available to many were scented powders. These scented powders also added the benefit of, of absorbing wetness, which makes you feel cooler when it's hot. For men, they used a spice and perfume infused rum called bay rum. It was invented for use by sailors in the 1500s and the scent is still made today. I know that the thought of bathing with a pitcher of water in a bowl might seem disgusting to you, but I want to leave you with this thought. If you were hospitalized and unable to bathe yourself, what would a nurse bring to your bedside? Some water, a rag, and soap, and then she or he would proceed to cleanse your body. While well, we have a few things that are more disposable in the hospital setting today, it's essentially the same a wet washing cloth. So if it's effective enough for the hospital, wouldn't a little more elaborate version of it be suitable to keep oneself clean at home? It's just a thought. Anyway, I hope you have a great rest of your week. And